My name is Iman North and I will serve as the moderator for this session. Um, unless Judge Osagira pops in, then I'll turn it over to her. Um, so first we will just start by introducing our panel. Um, the first panelist we have is the U.S. Assistant Attorney, Dana King. Can you introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon. I'm actually the U.S. Attorney. Um, I'm sorry. I knew okay. I needed to take that out. <laughs> it is okay. I'm Dina King. I um, was nominated by President Biden in November of 2021 and confirmed by the U.S. Senate uh, for this role as United States Attorney, which is the top federal law enforcement official in the western part of the state of North Carolina. So really pleased to be with everyone. Um, I attended NC State for my undergraduate degree and North Carolina Central University uh, for my law school degree. And then next. I'm sorry, Ms. North. Um, U.S. Attorney uh, Dina King failed to say, and she's always very humble, as our first Black woman, um, and actually, person of color for the uh, Western District of North Carolina. So I, you know, I have to make sure you get your props. You worked hard for that. <laughs> Thank you, I'm sorry, Ms. North, or I, I think um, Judge Asagera is um, on too. So I'll yes. turn it back to you. Okay. I, I am here, I'm sorry. I had logged on to the main room. So I found everybody, welcome everybody. Welcome, Judge Asigera. Um, we're just doing the introductions right now, and we just um, introduced the U.S. Attorney, um, Dana King, and now we are on to Attorney Yama Arrington, and we can just go down the list before we start the Thank questions. You. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I, it just froze a little bit. Is there, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yama Arrington. Um, I am a staff attorney at Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy. My background before that, I used to work at Legal Aid of North Carolina doing housing law here within the Charlotte office. I'm originally from Freetown, Sierra Leone, West Africa. Um, my family immigrated to the United States when I was two years old and um, home is New York and also West Africa. And I'm, I'm, privileged, and I'm thankful and, I and I'm really grateful for the privilege to have that. Um, uh, I, my undergrad is from Berkeley College and my law school is from Charlotte School of Law and I'm very happy to be here and um, hope all the college students will be able to have some resources and be able to pull something from this because um, this is a really great opportunity that I'm so glad to see many of you um, taking the opportunity to, to learn more about what the next steps are. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everybody, um, I'm Anna Delgado. I'm um, an attorney here in Charlotte. I'm an associate attorney at a firm called Garfinkel Immigration. Um, we primarily do business immigration matters, um, but we have a small family immigration practice. Um, my undergrad is from UNC Chapel Hill. I actually grew up um, just the south of Charlotte, um, so North Carolina, but went to law school at University of Minnesota um, and just decided to come back. Um, my background, I love that we're introducing where we're from. Um, I'm from Caracas, Venezuela, which also really transferred um, into why I do immigration law. Um, I'm excited. I've seen most of you at the morning session, the law school sessions in here. So you're getting a really great program and I'm excited to talk to you more about it now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Gary Henderson. I am uh, a native of Charlotte, uh, born and raised, uh, graduate from West Charlotte High School. Um, with undergrad at Appalachian State University uh, Law School at North Carolina Central. I am a district court judge here in Charlotte. I've been on the bench for the last uh, 10 plus years. Uh, and for all of that time, I've been in family court. Uh, my family is helping, I mean, my passion is helping uh, families and children. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you today. Thank you. Okay, now Judge Asagara, you can introduce yourself and jump into the questions. Okay, I have unmuted myself. Yeah, ap apologies again for starting late, but I'm Judge uh, Cecilio Seguera, and I'm a district court judge here in uh, Mecklenburg County. I was appointed last August by uh, the go Governor Cooper, and I was elected in November. So I'm a new judge, and and I my one of my esteemed colleagues is here, Judge Henderson, who has helped me so much, especially in fa the family law court. I have a more of a criminal 
background. I was a federal public defender for 17 years. And before that, I was at uh, Pisco Legal Services in Asheville, North Carolina, Buncombe County, and a private practice attorney at a medium firm in Los Angeles, California, from where I'm from. But let's get um, on with the questions. And I'm so happy to meet everybody, including um, Ms. King. I've heard so much about you. Congratulations um, on your appointment also to the Western District of North Carolina. Uh, congratulations again. But first question I have, and we don't have um, a lot of time, so um, we'll start with getting into law school. Um, and I will, th this will go out to everyone. Uh, first question would be, why did you decide you wanted to go to law school? And um, I, I'll pick somebody if somebody doesn't go first. Judge Henderson. All right, thank you. Uh, I decided I wanted to go to law school because that's uh, kind of, uh, even going back to high school, that was kind of the career path that, um, uh, that highlighted itself most to me. Uh, most of the people that I looked up to were uh, attorneys. Uh, and uh, I come from a family, my mom was a social worker, my dad was a, a, a preacher, a pastor. Uh, I come from a family of where helping people was, was kind of what we do. Uh, and if I'm gonna help people, I, I'd like to be in, the, in a position where I, I earn good money for it. Uh, and so lawyers going to law school appear to be the, the proper route for that. Okay. Um, did any of, of the other panelists want to answer that question? I was inspired actually um, by watching the Cosby show. And so on the Cosby show, many of you know that the mother, Claire Huxtable, was an attorney. And so for me, that was the first time that I saw an African American female depicted on television in a professional light. Um, before then, most of the Black women that I saw on TV were in some type of um, service or labor-oriented role, housekeepers or maids or, or nannies. And so seeing this, this woman on TV that was a mom, um, a wife, and a lawyer just really intrigued me, and I wanted to be just like her. Like so many of the other panelists, at the time, I knew um, no attorneys at all, definitely no attorneys of color and definitely no, no female attorneys. And so I was truly sparked by this fictional character that I saw depicted on TV. And it's, uh, some people in the panel might be too young to remember the Cosby show, but they're reruns. But I think <laughs> Huxtable inspired a lot of women of color because she did the same for myself also. And I was always so impressed by the way she dressed, yes, how she presented yes. herself and I wanted to be that as well. Yes. So um, let's. I, um, I would like to just also add that um, similarly with the other panelists, um, uh, I was around a lot of attorneys growing up and specifically a lot of human rights attorneys who worked for the UN. So I really kind of wanted to work on the humanitarian rights aspect of it or criminal law within, within the, my own neighborhood or community. So that's really what inspired me to go. Um, to law school. Ms. Delgado, did you want to answer that question also? Sure. I think the only other thing I would add um, that might be um, really specific to you guys as college students is probably by my junior year, sophomore year, I realized I've studied all the humanities. I don't, I don't know really where to go with this. It kind of ends up looking like law school or, or policy work. Um, and I really liked the idea of working one-on-one -on -one with people rather than on like large scale policy. Um, so the legal field really spoke to me in that way that I could be on an individual basis with folks and, and work on cases that way. And I, I really liked the decision I made with that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me, I'm going to combine a couple questions here for the panelists. Um, and I know the students will be very interested in both uh, the answers to these questions. Um, first question is what helped you get accepted into law school and why did you choose the law school that you eventually went to? Judge Henderson, do you, I, I can pick people or? <laughs> That's fine. Uh, <laughs> what, what helped me to get into law school? Let, let me tell you this. So um, even though when I, first went to college, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer one day. 
um, I got to college and I got involved in college life uh, and um, was not as focused on my, my grades. And so uh, I ended up going to grad school. So I have a master's as well. Um, but I went to grad school more so because I wanted to show that I have the uh, academic um, aptitude and ability to succeed in law school. So, a couple, so before I got into law, law school, uh, I had to show from an academic standpoint that I had the ability. And then two, there is the LSAT. Uh, and the LSAT is, um, at least to me, um, how law schools uh, can narrow down or keep, keep out uh, a lot of students. And so it is crucial that you treat, I tell everyone that I, that I mentor this, it's crucial that you treat the LSAT uh, like a job, uh, that you prepare for it like a job, that you prepare for it months in advance, um, and that you do well on that LSAT because the LSAT, in addition to your academic background, is going to be what determines what, get, what gets you into law school. I don't know if the, the, the essays you write or recommendations you, you get, I don't know if any of those things matter. If you don't have the grades and you don't have the LSAT score, you can forget it. And so you need those two things. Um, I would also add um, to that and just say that with also your grades, um, also apply for scholarships, you know, um, and have that access to it, which is also going to um, tie in with your grade. So a high GPA is really what's needed. And um, I had a high GPA and also just also um, a lot of community service as well as um, your extracurricular activities from what you, other than just your academics, what you were involved with outside of the classroom. So that was really important. And all that ties into essentially your application package with your LSAT scores and, you know, um, going where um, you get scholarships is really important just due to the cost of law, student, uh, of, of law school. Um, so that's really important as well. Yeah, I think I'll add, um, of course, the numbers, um, you know, we can all, we all know that GPA and LSAT scores are important. Um, but like, like we all mentioned, you know, the extracurricular activities, I think um, one of the things that really helped me is that some of my extracurricular activities had a law focus to them. So that shows law schools, you know, you're serious about the field. Um, as an undergrad, you are, and that's what I did, um, you can volunteer for some of the law clinics. Um, if they have, you know, administrative work or translator work that you can do, they'll appreciate that. And you can add that to an application. Um, you know, I also chose my law school course based on, um, as we mentioned, the scholarship package, I think it's an absolutely very important thing to look at. Um, I also looked at the practical experiences I could gain there. Um, I knew I wanted to go into, you know, ideally immigration law. Some law schools don't have an immigration clinic at all, have one to two immigration classes. That just wasn't going to be a good fit for me. So really weigh their programs um, versus, you know, what you think you might like, because um, of course that might change, but that is something I would definitely look at. Okay, Miss King, did you want to answer that, or I have a lot more questions on my list and not a lot of time, so I can I can direct another question to you. I'll just um, wait to the next question. Okay, let's do this. What um, what if it was if you found it difficult or not? What made law school diffi difficult if if it was difficult for you, and what were the classes like? So I, I am one of the people that actually think law school was difficult. For me, it was actually the first time I thought school was difficult. Um, I did not think even college was that difficult, uh, but law school was difficult. And I think why it was difficult was just the amount of work. Um, there's a lot of reading. And so sometimes I hear people say, I don't really like to read. And, and that's, you're gonna have to get over that, especially your first year of, of law school. But not only just reading, but your ability to comprehend what you're reading and to be able to adequately explain what you read. And so anybody can read something, but can you then um, explain what you read and then be prepared to answer questions based on what you read? And so it was just a lot of work. And for me, one of my strengths had always been time management. And so that definitely ended up being one of the best techniques that I was able to utilize in law school. But 
first my first year there were a whole lot of late nights <laughs> um and early mornings just trying to make sure that I stayed on top of work all right Miss Arrington did you did you want to answer that also yes it's Arrington uh, um, Arrington I'm sorry about yes. that um yeah uh I think um I would just I concur 100 percent it was really um, on top of just juggling your caseload, you have to juggle your social life and your family. And if you're married, that's something else as well, your partner, whatever it is, but juggling all the different aspects when you have just so much information being thrown at you is very overwhelming. Um, you know, uh, so I would say the juggling of just your your schoolwork and your and everything else is one of the most one of the most difficult parts of law school. Um, because getting through the classes is something that like you can study, you can put a lot of time in, you can do flashcards, but I think that aspect of just your personal relationships truly can suffer if you don't balance it well. Right. I'm gonna I'll move on to another question and Judge Henderson, I'll direct this one to you and maybe you can explain it a little. The question is how important are journals in moot court in law school? You might wanna explain what, just briefly what moot court is and the journals are um, and if they're important. And then do you um, have to have a high school GPA to be on a journal or moot court? That's the question. Uh, actually, uh, Judge, let me defer that to uh, someone else. I was. I was more on the trial ad team, not the yeah. moot court team. So I, I can speak more about trial ad than I can moot court. <laughs> All right. Did one of the other panelists want to answer that question? Yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, so moot court is, you know, basically kind of a simulation um, that you get put through. Um, different students will be on, you know, either side of a fictional case. A lot of the time it's based on a real case. And you basically treat it like a real case. You have either a professor or sometimes, you know, a sitting judge come in and um, you argue in front of them. And, and it's one of the very few times that you'll like get actual litigation experience, you know, quote unquote, in law school. Um, the journals um, is, you know, more research and writing based, but you'll get published, um, you know, ideally through law school. You really delve into a certain topic for one, two years. Um, I'll say we, so I went to Minnesota law, they required you to be on one or the other. Um, so if you go there, you will be on one or the other. Um, basically, um, you can petition to be on a journal, you have to do a writing sample. Um, you know, that's kind of its own process and there's multiple journals. I chose um, to go into moot court and they have different moot courts within, you know, that larger structure. I specifically did international law moot court. Um, you know, there wasn't any GPA required for any of those. Um, the journals specifically were just graded on your application packet and they were, that was purely it and it was blind graded, you know, no GPAs or names were attached to that. So for that, it was just really based on your writing ability. Um, moot court, you could sign up, um, you know, there were some limited spots, but it was more of a lottery system. Thank you. Um, I mean, let me move on to another question and that I think the students would like to know is, is there anything that uh, you would like to have known before going to law school? Or wish you had known before you entered law school or some advice somebody would have given you before you started? Yeah. I, go ahead. Um, that it's not just about grades, it's also about social experiences and communicating with people, um, communicating with your colleagues, uh, communicating with professors. Um, it's just not about grades it, um, because law school will end and uh, life starts. Judge Henderson. And I'm gonna guess I'm gonna answer that a different way um, by telling about my experience. So no, there's not really anything I wish I had known, but that's because of the position I was in when I went to law school. Uh, I was five years out of undergrad at that point in time. I had been through a master's program, had come out and worked for a couple of years, uh, but I worked in a, uh, a job where it was related to the law. So I had a chance to go to court. I had a chance to uh, learn about pleadings and, uh, and, and reviewed uh, documents. And so um, 
there was nothing, so to speak, new to me when I when I got to law school. And so, I, and I say that to you to say someone mentioned earlier about uh, having different experiences. Um, you don't want to get to law school and be shocked. So you want to try to get as many different experiences as you can now. So try to do internships while you're in college, uh, try, uh, whether they're paid or not, because what matters is the experience that you're getting uh, so that you won't be shocked when you get further along in your career, whether it be law school or whether it be your career. Thank you. Thank you. you, you Judge Henderson, you are a, a, actually answering another question that I was going to ask of the panelist as well, is what advice would you give for selecting uh, internships and why would you decide you want to do an in internship during law school? Is there another panelist that wants to, 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 to discuss internships or volunteering at different uh, firms or public interest locations? I'd love to. Um, so I went into law school thinking I wanted to do business law. That's why I strategically ma majored in business management in undergrad while in law school by virtue of participating on the trial team and some of the internship opportunities that I had. That's when my focus shifted to um, being intrigued with the criminal justice system. And so I would encourage you, although you may think you know what area you want to practice in, kind of you know, put your foot in other areas to be able to help you see whether or not that's truly what you want to do. One of the things I learned in law school is I definitely did not want to practice family law. Like that was definitive to me. Um, the other thing for me is I interned in a public defender's office while in law school. And I absolutely loved that experience, but it was while in that experience in Durham County, North Carolina, I noticed the lack of diversity in the prosecutor's uh, prosecution's office. So that's what then inspired me to want to become a prosecutor. Because I'm like, I'm sitting here and the only people that look like me in the courtroom are the people that are accused of crimes. Why is that? Why can't I then transfer some of the knowledge and skills that I have to then be a familiar face on the other side to be able to try to right some of the wrongs that I saw within the criminal justice system? And so I think the more you are able to utilize internships as opportunities to really narrow your focus on what you like, but also maybe what you don't like, um, I think are really good benefits. Right. Um, I, I think that's very important. I think internships are extremely important because you might do an internship somewhere and decide exactly like Ms. King um, indicated that this is something I just don't want to do. And I, I saw that a lot in law school where people would volunteer at a public defender office or at the DA's office and decide, hey, this is something I don't want to do. They went into corporate law. So it just uh, so, so important. Um, before we finish up here, I, I think one of the most um, important questions, and I think all the students want to know, is money. Is a money? Uh, what? How did you pay for law school? Law school was so expensive. It was expensive when I went to law school in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it's expensive now. So if, if the panelists can uh, uh, let the students know, you know how, how you paid for it, financial aid, mom and dad paid for it cash. I know I, I, I know people whose parents paid for it or also whose parent who, who took out loans or worked a lot of different types of jobs. So if the panelists can answer that, uh, please for the students. So um, I, my 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 law school experience i pretty much got majority scholarships um my i just had to come out of cost for cost of living and um also just the bar and whatnot so scholarship is really something that's important and i think you have to rely on um you know those strengths that you can and also again uh i thank god that you know the bank of mom and dad also exists where they uh definitely provided um for moments where i needed help and uh helped me in that regards as well so um while i know that that definitely is a privilege because that not everybody has that so um yes a little bit um definitely took out financial aid but majority was scholarships and you know just family help All right, uh, Judge Henderson. Uh, I can tell you for me, it was mostly um, scholarships, grants, and loans. Uh, but I would tell you, I, I had very few loans because I also worked. Um, and so um, let me just say this, it, it matters where you decide to go. We, we are in North Carolina and North Carolina has some of the best 
colleges and law schools in the country. Uh, and if you're a North Carolina resident, uh, then you get the North Carolina resident price. Uh, and that can make a huge difference um, when, uh, when, you, when you finish and you look at what you owe later. <laughs> what you owe later. Um, so uh, please take advantage of some of our great law schools here, here in the state, that's what I was saying. Ms. Delgado, did you want to answer that question also? Yeah, um, I was also going to know, you know, similarly, scholarships um, were the bulk of my law, and that's one of the reasons I went to Minnesota. Um, a lot of schools um, will offer, you know, significant amount of money to out-of-state students as well, um, because, you know, most people, a lot of people, for example, Minnesota are like, oh, that's it's negative 60 degrees sometimes, I'm not going to go there, but you know, then I, I got a huge scholarship. Um, as far as actual costs of living, because um, that was really mostly just going towards tuition, books, things like that. Um, I did take out loans for that. Um, I worked um, 2L and 3L, but um, I was a research assistant within the law school. So I kind of got to be able to still be around my professors and, and things that were going to benefit in my studies. Um, because there isn't a whole lot of extra time that you have during your actual law school experience. But Ms. King, did you want to answer that question? Sure. I uh, received academic scholarships for undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate career. So I worked while there to save up money for law school. While in law school, I also utilized grants and financial aid. So I was able to um, finish all of my college education without ever getting any loans for school. Yeah, and then um, I, for the first year, a lot of law schools, and I think it's the same, they, they if you're full-time, don't allow students to work. So just keep that in mind if when you're researching law schools, um, ask the admissions counselors, you know, what, what is it, what can, if you can work during that first year of law school. So keep in mind that it's either going to be that, you'll have to pay for law school some way by, and you might not be able to work that first year. Um, thank you for, for answering all those questions. Okay, so we, um, I, I did wanna talk also about mentor, mentoring. Did, did anyone have a mentor or have anyone that they could uh, confide in that, that helped them either in the process of trying to get into law school because you, do, you also need a lot of letters of recommendation um, and then while you were in law school, any, any good advice you can give the students? Anyone have mentors? Um, let me just add, I can't say I necessarily had mentors, but remember I talked about having work experience that was related to the law, which exposed me to attorneys, which, uh, means, which means I had supervisors who I could then rely on to to write those recommendations and, and whatnot for me. So, so in addition to getting experience from internships and experiences that you that you get, you can also get uh, mentors and uh, letter writers for you. <laughs> so it all it all it, it all comes back to benefit you, so to speak, uh, if you get involved with internships and uh, volunteering uh, in legal related type of activities. Does anyone else want to answer that question? I think we've got about three more minutes. Many of my mentors at the point that I was in law school were not lawyers. Again, I, I didn't know lawyers. Um, and so the mentors that really had shaped me just in becoming a successful person were people that I either met through church or people that I met through uh, my sorority or people that I met through other community engagement. And so one suggestion that I would give to you is um, if you are really interested in, in becoming a, a law professional. I think sometimes we immerse ourselves too much in the legal thing, field and we think that our entire circle has to be law oriented. And the law is, is so vast that even in terms of looking at who you might have write your letters of recommendation, you don't have to have all lawyers write your letters of recommendation to get into law school. You can utilize other people that are knowledgeable about who you are and can really speak about your strengths and your ability to succeed in law school that may also write really compelling letters. Thank you. I, th I think we might have a couple minutes for some questions. And I think I saw one in the chat. I'm not sure if I, I know how to answer the chat. I might not be in control of this, but does anyone have a question for the panelists? 
Let me look read the question out of the chat. We actually have until 215 now, so I'd be happy oh. to read the question out um, oh. from the chat if you'd like me to do so. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Canali. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you, Judge. Nice to see um, you as well. Yes, so please. our question is from Judith Van Boven, and it says, hello, thank you for your time and being here with all of us. I wanted to ask if taking a year off is a good idea. If so, what can I do during that year off to prepare myself for law school, LSAT, networking, internships, things like that? So just a little elaboration on that. The question's taking a year off um before you go to law school did did any and i think judge henderson touched on that a little bit he he worked did any of the other panelists Ms. Delgado, did you want to answer that did you take any time off or just head right into law school and go to work yeah so i went straight in <laughs> um i i liked kind of you know keeping with the academic state of mind that I was able to go straight through, but I also saw a lot of success for people that took some time in between and had an eight to five um, because they brought that eight to five mentality to law school and treated it like a job and did very well um, with time management skills that you don't necessarily have in college if you're picking only Tuesday, Thursday classes, for example. Um, I would say, I think, most of the people that I know that at least did that took the LSAT already. Um, before that, um, I wanted to touch on just if I could go back and talk to me, I would take the LSAT as early as possible. Um, since especially admissions are usually rolling admissions, you want to have that score secure and ready to go by that point. Um, but I think, you know, there's pros and cons both ways to either going straight through undergrad or, or taking some time off. All right. Um, Ms. King, did you take any time off or go straight uh, from undergrad into law school? I went straight. And so my response to the question would be, if there is a reason for you to take time off, um, i.e. You, you just don't feel like you're ready or um, financially you need time to work or there's some family um, emergencies or constraints that you think would prevent you from being completely committed, then by all means, take the time off. But I think if there is no reason to, I wouldn't just take the time off just for the sake of taking it off. Um, I think similar to Attorney Delgado, there are strengths in going straight through where your mind is already focused on studying and you have not um, ascertained a whole bunch of additional debt uh, by virtue of, you know, some of the things that we kind of get into when we have idle time. And so um, for me, it was beneficial to go straight through. The, the one backside of that, it, I will tell you, and it was somewhat in response to another question that came out about um, in terms of what do you wish you would have known. I'm going to answer it similar to Judge Henderson, not necessarily what I wish I would have known because I knew it, but just tips that I would leave for each of you. At some point, you're also going to graduate from law school and you're going to start your career as an attorney. And most of you here, I'm assuming, are diverse individuals, which is why you are attending today's um, workshop. There are still going to be instances in which, although you have uh, you're this wonderful law degree, that you're not necessarily going to be treated like everybody else gets treated. And so that was kind of a reality check for me. I really thought once I got this law degree, I'd walk in rooms and everybody would know I was an attorney and I was going to get the same level of treatment of, as all my colleagues. And I'll tell you, I go places even now as a U.S. attorney and people know that they're meeting with the U.S. attorney and I enter the room and they're looking behind me expecting to see someone else. And so that is just a reality of the way things are, but also why I truly am excited when I see more diverse candidates wanting to enter into this law profession. Thank you for that response. And I, I think I can, uh, one of the questions also was um, piggybacking off on that one was just, it was describe uh, your experience as potentially one of the few people of color in the class, and, and you are going to probably be one of the few people of color as an attorney, um, but uh, now we're speaking with uh, undergrads who are, who are almost in law school, so uh, how, how was your experience? I know it's changed. There's, there's a, a panelist here that have recently graduated or been practicing within five years, and there's some who've been practicing for well over 20 years. 
Um, so any panelists, uh, how would you please um, let, let us know what your experience says were in, high, in, in law school as a, a, as a student of color? <laughs> well, let me say this. I, I went to North Carolina Central, so you're not going to have that experience in North Carolina uh, Central of uh, being um, the only or a limited person of color in the classroom. The, the classroom is going to be uh, pretty diverse. Now, let me say this about North Carolina Central. The, the population, at least when I was in law school, was still about, I, was, I don't know, about 50% of it was uh, non-African American. So um, even though it's the HBCU, the law school is very diverse. Um, uh, and so you, you won't have that experience at North Carolina Central. That's my plug for North Carolina Central. <laughs> okay. Um, I will say it's it's challenging at times, but it's one of those things where you shouldn't let it get to you because you, if you think about the profession, the profession is majority white. Um, once you finish law school, you're going to enter the profession where, again, you're within the five or 10 percent of the minority within your specific diverse background. So um, uh, I would say, you know, you you, you focus and you, you know everybody takes the same test you make sure that you just focus on your scores you focus on what you can do and also try to engage in other like um other activities that the that the law school has like if there is a woman's law um uh you know women's law program or something like that just to engage with different people but um you know it, it wasn't anything i guess that was i you, you had, I had people in law school where I guess this was their first interaction with other black people, just like how an undergrad when people go to college and, you know, they're just like, wow, this is my first interaction with someone else of a diverse background. So I will say, you know, if you have encountered that where you are in life now, it will be the same kind of experience that you will get, you, you would feel, or the same emotions that you would feel when you encounter that later down in law school. All right. Did any, anyone else want to answer the question? All right. Well, one of my last questions for the panelists is, is, did you feel that law school, everybody spent a lot of money on their law school, uh, do you think law school was a good investment? I absolutely think law school was a, a good investment. I have thoroughly enjoyed my legal career um, and just really look forward to what my future holds. Same. Yeah, I'll I'll agree. Um, because I, I also not only consider it a, a substantial monetary investment, but a huge time investment. I mean, I kept an extra three years um staying in school while I saw a lot of my friends or you know colleagues that were not in law school already getting paychecks every two weeks and you know I'm studying and, and incurring debt. Um, but I graduated and I love my job. I really, you know, can't imagine doing anything different. Um, the law school I went to, I feel like I've made, you know, a great network there. I thought it was, you know, a great use of my time and an investment for, for me and my career. Okay, Judge Henderson, did you want to answer that question? Uh, yes. Uh, practicing law has been everything that I uh, thought it would be a great opportunity to fulfill, um, I guess, my personal uh, desire, which is to help people. Uh, and so really, hopefully, that's pretty much everyone's is that even if you're working for a corporation <laughs> uh, or, or doing corporate law, uh, ultimately, we're, we're about helping uh, people um, solve problems. And so um, law school and, and the practice of law has been great to me in that respect. All right. I think we've got about three more minutes. Did anyone have a question? Anyone who want to put a question in the chat? Um, did anyone want to share any of the panelists also want to share any last minute remarks uh, with the students about law school in general, why you chose specifically your um, profession and any last advice you'd give the, the students about to enter law school? Um, I will say work hard, make connections, and um, once you enter the legal profession, 
pick something that you enjoy because you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. And, um, you know, that's the important part at the end of the day is how you choose to practice law. Um, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a tough profession and uh, you, you, you want to do something that you're passionate about, not just passionate about, but also good at because you are, you are uh, working with people and you're making some very important decisions for a lot of people, whether it be uh, in the criminal, criminal field, corporate field, um, civil field. So it's, it's very important that it's your passion. Um, but I do have, a, I, I'm reading the, the chat box and the question here is if, if the panelists would provide any contact information for the students, if they do have any further questions, um, if the panelists know how to do it, if you want to put uh, contact information, there, there's room in there for uh, all your contact information. But I think we're, um, we're finishing up here. I think that's all the time we have. I'll read from my little script. Um, if you need any other assistance, ask for help. Um, on the dashboard, member of uh, the event team will be happy to assist you. But thank you for your time, everybody. And this is already starting your investment in, in um, school. You're meeting people. You're networking with a lot of attorneys um, of color, uh, women and attorneys of color. So, um, you know, congratulations even on being here today on a Saturday afternoon. It's a little chilly, but it's nice outside. But uh, thank you, everybody, for letting me host. And thank you for um, all my esteemed colleagues and the, pa the panelists. And hi, Judge McCoy Mitchell, it's very nice to see you. It's not nice that we don't see you in the courtroom as much anymore, but nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Segarra. You did a great job along with everyone else. Thank you all for being here. And all of you are still my colleagues, although I did get to retire a little while ago, but still very supportive of our young people. And thank you for being here. I also remain available to all of you as well. Thank you. Judge McCoy Mitchell, you're still my mentor. So your, uh, your, your retirement did not end <laughs> that, just so you know. And, and that's the same ditto here for me as well. And I received that. I received it. Thank you. Now, you see, that was a good point. You always have a mentor. I have mentors too. So don't ever forget that opportunity. Focus on it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.